I am also excited that you're here as we're continuing on with our series talking about tough questions. Last week we started this series saying that, that when you look through the Gospels, over a hundred times Jesus asks people questions. They're coming to him with questions, and he turns it around and starts asking them questions. And we're looking in the month of March at four specific questions that still apply to us today, that we still should be asking ourselves today, because it, it'll help us understand where we are in our walk, in our life, in our journey, in our our faith with Christ. And as we, especially as we get prepared for the first Sunday in April to gather with the rest of the world to come together and celebrate Easter, you know, how, how are we going to answer these questions? The first question, you know, we looked at, if you remember, if you were here, if not, I encourage you to check it out online or, you know, get a copy of it and stuff. Uh, it was talking about Jesus was with some guys in a boat and a, a swall come up and the storm came up and water was coming in their boat. And, you know, they were all worried and terrified and he gets up and calms the storm. And he asked that first question we looked at last week, which is, why are you so afraid? And his question was, hang on, guys, you've been hanging with me. You've seen me do these powerful miracles and all this other stuff, and I'm with you. Why are you so afraid when the storm comes? And we said in our life, it's the same thing. If we really believe what we're going to celebrate on Sunday, April 1st, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God that came and lived and died and on the third day rose again, and when we give our lives to him and surrender to him and turn to him and call out to him, if we really believe all that, then when... Life shows up. The storms of life show up. Why are we so afraid still? A great question to ask ourselves. You know. Today, we want to continue, and we're going to take a look. And, you know, there's those times in our life that maybe we have problems, that we have situations, those times where we're praying to God, and maybe we're not seeing an answer. We're seeking out this miracle. And, and we have to ask ourselves this question that Jesus is going to ask of these two blind guys that we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 9. And before we get into the chapter, I kind of want to tell you what happened just before we read this, okay? Just before, we, what we're, just before what we're gonna read here in Matthew 9, there's a little girl that passes away. And Jesus gets called in to be with that little girl and he brings her back to life. So the people are kind of freaking out. <laughs> you know, as you can imagine, here's a girl that's dead. Jesus walks in the room, and the two of them come walking out. And so somehow, these two blind guys, they hear about this and, and, and that, and they know about this man named Jesus. They hear about this, and this is where we pick up our story in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, that says this. As Jesus went on from there, on from the event that I just talked about, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Now that phrase that you see are those two words calling out. That's our English translation. And, and that's what happened. They called out. But, but it kind of cuts a little bit short on, on the intensity of that. Because in the Greek, if you look at the Greek that makes up those two words, it literally means to cry out with animalistic cry. To cry out with an animalistic cry. And, for example, the same Greek word is used in Revelation 22 when it talks about a woman screaming in labor during childbirth. And maybe some of you can understand that better than I can understand that. But that's the reference, this animalistic cry. That's what these two guys are having. Because here's this person that can help them in the situation that they're in. They're blind. And I don't know how many of you, you know, have had no people that are blind that you know. Or, or I realize we all struggle. And at times, maybe with our eyesights and stuff, we have to have glasses we can see better and we have issues with our eyes but I've I've never been blind you know I've had to, the the time that I think probably that came the closest that with my eyes and and stuff and Melinda and I we weren't dating yet but we were out in Southern California and I was helping her put her brake pads on her Datsun B210 and I threw the picture up here because Ashley hasn't understood an illustration I've done yet Davy Jones and all these movie references she just doesn't know so I'm putting a picture so at least she'll know what a Datsun B210 looks like to help her out and understand my sermons and stuff but that's Melinda's car right there Datsun B210 and we were putting the brake pads on and it came time that the pads were on and we had to bleed the lines and stuff and I asked her to help and, and long story short somewhere in miscommunication she thought I said press on the brakes and and she pressed on the brakes and all this brake fluid went out into my eyes and stuff and this is back then this is a couple days ago you know a couple weeks years ago and stuff and this wasn't all you know the detergents and stuff were in it and all my eyes they started burning it started to blur and all I can remember is I was dancing around like a squirrel trying to get missed by a car you know and trying to find a sink and went and rinsed it out that's the closest I probably ever come to feeling like I was going to be blind and that but 
here these guys are, these two guys. We don't know how long they've been blind in their life, but they're blind. And they're crying out. Animalistic cry comes from them to this Jesus. And it says in verse 28, When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them. Here's our question for today. He asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight was restored. Notice it doesn't say according to their income. It doesn't say according to the section of town that you live in. It doesn't say according to, you know, because you've been really good for the last six months and never missed synagogue, you know, and, and been there with it. It doesn't say according to the clothes you wore, because back then they actually wore Hawaiian type robes, but that's a whole nother story. It doesn't say according to any of these other things. It says according to their faith, which should be highly encouraging to us today. To know that God responds to faith. I mean, we've learned in Scripture that it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. God loves our faith. And if we have faith, we've just learned and we can learn that we can actually move God's heart. We can touch God's heart when we step out and have faith. But I also know at the same time, even though this can build our faith and it should build our faith and this can encourage us and it should, it can also be really discouraging because I realize that there are certain church circles, there are certain Christian groups, you know, that sometimes people can get pretty cruel with this teaching and they can say, well, the reason that God didn't do it is because of your lack of faith. And so then we have all this guilt that's lumped on us. We start feeling guilty. You know, maybe I didn't pray loud enough. Maybe I didn't pray long enough. Maybe I didn't pray the right prayer. Maybe I didn't cast out Satan in the name of Jesus. Maybe I didn't end it right. You know, I said in the name of Jesus. You know, when you end a prayer, you're supposed to say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe I didn't stand on my head, stick my nose up. I don't know. My finger, my, my nose, you know, I don't know what it is. I didn't. There was maybe there's some ritual. We start to have all this guilt that we lump on ourselves because maybe I didn't do something right. And so, while yes, God does honor faith, and that's true. At the same time, many of us live under this false sense of guilt, believing we did something wrong, which what then can raise the question for us, what kind of faith does God honor then? And that's what I want us to spend the rest of our time together, looking at this story of the two blind men and learning three types of faith that, honor, that God honors, that blesses God, that touches his heart, that moves his heart. The first is this. God honors a faith that believes when it doesn't see. God honors a faith that believes when it doesn't see. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. It's the assurance of things we can't see. In fact, this is what's happening in Matthew that we just read. Remember? It says, you know, they're calling out to Jesus, and, that, and Jesus, for whatever reason, continues to go inside. And these guys, you know, they haven't seen yet. They follow him inside. And then the question's asked, do you believe I can do this? And nothing's happened to them yet. They've only walked inside with him and had a question. And they said, yes, Lord, we believe. We believe. That's a faith that believes, but hasn't seen anything happen yet. And maybe that could be a good question for some of us to ask ourselves today, you know. And when challenges come our way, or maybe you're in the midst of a challenge today, a relational challenge, a physical challenge, a financial challenge, a spiritual challenge. Do you believe that God is able to handle that challenge? Do you believe that all things are possible with God? And I understand the churchy answer, because if you've been raised in church, your answer is supposed to be, oh, yes, hallelujah, I believe. <laughs> And I'm not mocking anybody, please, that that, that, that gives in that answer. If you believe that, awesome. But we're, we're trained that that's how we're supposed to respond. But if we step back and evaluate, which I'm always encouraging you and challenge you to do, to evaluate our life, you know, so often our actions and our words betray us, do they not? Our actions and our words show the truth of what we really believe. We got God up here saying, just call on me. I want to help. I want to help. 
Reminds me of a story that I heard. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman, true story, where his cell phone busted, and so he had to get his wife's old cell phone out to use it until he could get a new one. And he transferred all of his stuff to her cell phone, you know, and contacts and everything. And and but there was this one app that kept popping up, and it was causing him to not be able to use the phone right or something along that. And the husband and the wife were sitting down. They were trying to figure this out. They were trying to get it to work. And all of a sudden, their seven-year-old child comes along and says, I can help. And, you know, they just kind of ignore him, whatever. And the two of them continue to work, continue to get more frustrated, more irritated. To no avail, they can't get it. While the, their child, the seven-year-old child, is constantly saying, I can help. Give it to me. I'll help. Give it to me. I'll help. And finally, I don't know if out of frustration or to shut him up, they give him the phone. And in less than a minute, he fixes it. And that. And they look a little astonished. And, you know, they, they let him know they appreciate it and everything. And just as any seven-year-old, you could almost hear him saying this, you know, he looks at them and says, the problem with the two of you is that you never ask for my help. And when you listen to that and you look at that and you think, you know what, as children of God and our faith and our walk, are we like that sometimes? Or maybe are we like that all the time? You know, God's sitting here, I can help, I want to help. Do you believe I can help? You know, and, 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 and our actions and our words kind of give us, give it away. Like I said, it often indicate what we really believe. I mean, even the way we speak our words, we've talked about this before. Have you ever thought this or said this or heard somebody say this? You know, when it comes down to it, oh, oh, well, I guess all we can do now is what? Pray. I guess all we can do is pray. I mean, I like to, this is how my brain works. I like to imagine God going up there when he hears that statement going, <gasps> all they can do is pray. Ooh, they're in deep doo-doo. They're in a lot of poo-poo, you know, and stuff. Because all they can do is pray. They have to turn, they really got to be hurting if that's all they can do now. You know, when maybe that's where we should go first in our life, in our prayer. I mean, think about it. Ask yourself, in the last week or two, what were you praying about faithfully every single day? What were we praying about faithfully every single day? Maybe if we got honest, we might look at that, and some of us, I don't know, not much right now. You know? I heard it put this way. What you pray reflects what you believe about God. Think about that. What you pray reflects what you believe about God. So if you're not praying much, if you're not praying about much, then maybe that shows that you really don't believe that God is active, that God does care, and that God can do anything about it. You know, and if all you do is ask God for the little things that are probably going to happen anyway. Now, before I go into this, let me say this. I want to be very crystal clear, okay? I'm not saying that you should not pray these prayers, okay? If everybody heard me say, okay. Okay, good. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray these prayers. I'm saying if you only are praying these types of prayers, then maybe it should, you know, be a sign of what you do. But like, you know, you ever go on a long trip and you're praying and say, hey, God, as we go on this trip, please give us your travel mercies out and back. I've done it all the time. I do it with the youth group and that when they take off for trips and stuff like that. But, you know, do we do that every day when we get in the car or every time we get in the car? God, give me your travel mercies to work and back. God, give me your travel mercies to the grocery store and back. You know, I mean, I got in the car yesterday and we drove into town and came back. I didn't pray for it. I made it okay. Maybe I should have. I don't know. Maybe I scared other people with my driving. I don't know, you know, when it came to it, but I made it in. I mean, you know, you're praying something that might happen anyway. Like, you know, you come to a meal, Lord, thank you for this food that we're about to receive, you know, and bless it and nourish it to our bodies. Yeah. I mean, the nourishment is probably going to happen. And like, you know, as I was putting this together and thinking about this, you know, when it comes down to this aspect, I thought, okay, well, maybe for some of you, this is a great step of faith, because I've been with you and seen what you eat, you know, taking a ho-ho, putting nacho cheese over it, and then praying to God to bless that and nourish your body. That is stepping out in faith, probably, more than I have ever had with it. But, you know, when it comes to these things, the size of your request reveals the strength of your faith. What you pray about reveals what you believe about God, and God says, do you believe I'm able to do this? Do you believe I'm able to restore that relationship? Do you believe I can cure or I can help you get over that addiction? Do you believe that in the name of Jesus is bigger, you know, and his name can overcome anything and everything? Because a faith that honors God is a faith that believes even though it does not see. And the second kind of faith that honors God is a faith that persists when nothing changes. A faith that will persist when nothing changes, you know? A faith, basically, a faith that continues to believe. 
Again, think about these two blind guys. They cry out, that, this animalistic cry out, you know, son of David, you know, have mercy on us. And Jesus, I love it, just goes on into the building. And you can almost, like, sense their attitude or feel their attitude. They're like, oh, we're following them in, you know. And we're going to stay with this guy, and we're going to be with this guy. He's either going to heal us, or he's going to kick us out. But either way, we're staying here. Why? Because a faith that persists is the kind of faith that honors God. A faith that persists when nothing else changes. I, I like Colossians 4, 2, what it says about prayer. Be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray, giving thanks to God. We're to be persistent. What are you doing? You're giving thanks to God for something that has not even happened yet. And what is that? That takes faith. Persistent in prayer, continue to pray, even when things do not change. I love the story that Jesus tells in Luke 18 about, you know, about the widow. You know, not reading it and going into it. You can read it yourself. But how this widow kept going back to the unrighteous judge. She kept going and bugging and going and bugging and going and bugging until finally the unrighteous judge says, all right, you can have what you want. And then Jesus says this, if an unrighteous judge would be moved by the persistence of someone, how much more would a loving father respond to the faithful, persistent prayers of his children? God responds to a faith that doesn't give up. When I was at a leadership conference up in Chicago, and that Bill Hybels puts on each year, and that he got up, Bill Hybels got up and, and told a story uh, about a time that they had a baptism at his church. And he said he had the privilege of, of baptizing uh, this lady. She was like right at 80 years old. And he said it was just so neat to see her at that age and, uh, and coming to the faith, and it just what a blessing that was to partake. And, and when they came down from the baptism and that, you know, he got to meet her daughter that was between like 45 and 50, he said, and, and she was crying. And not just like crying, but she was like uncontrollably crying. And, and he wasn't sure if these were toy, tears of joy or what they were. And he says, honey, you should be excited. You should be happy. You should be joyful. You just got to see and witness your mother being baptized, your 80, almost 80-year-old 80 mother being baptized. And she said, oh, Bill, I've been praying this forever, and you don't know how many times I almost stopped praying. About two years in, I started thinking, really, is this doing any good? Five years, really, is there a God? Ten years, does he even listen to me? Does he even care? Fifteen years, it started screaming those things at me. Twenty years, there really is no God. Why are you praying? You're wasting your time and everybody else's. And she says, and now, here we are, 32 years later, and I almost stopped praying for my mother's salvation. So I don't know how this is going to speak to any of you, but I know there's probably some of you that have been praying about something, have been praying for something, and maybe it's been for a long time. And maybe you have those voices that are coming into your head also, or that voice that's saying, you're wasting your time. There really isn't a God. God isn't going to answer. This is stupid that you're praying for, whatever. And maybe God brought you here just to hear this, so you can understand this, so I could tell you that a faith that honors God is the faith that persists. Even though things do not change, and even though you don't see it, you continue believing, because that's the kind of faith that honors God. And the third kind of faith, that honors God is faith that works even when it doesn't make sense. Faith that works even when it doesn't make sense, when it's moved and marked by actions, even though everybody else thinks you're probably nuts and crazy. You know, a lot of the times we hope for things. You know, man, I sure hope my family member. I sure, I, I sure hope the church grows. I sure hope my family come, member comes to Christ. I sure hope people will come to this and, and hope and, and stuff. It's just an inward desire, but faith is a demonstration that moves and acts and works with faith. That's why James, I, I love James, the, the brother of Jesus, you know, he describes how Abraham's faith was marked by actions. If you don't know the story, I encourage you, I think it's one of the, the greatest faith-filled stories of the Bible. When God puts upon Abraham's heart to sacrifice his son. I mean, I've been a Christian for a few years, and I cannot imagine the obedience still where I'm at today, the obedience it took for Abraham to step up and to listen to God and to do this. You know, how he just listens to God and, okay, this is what you want. He gathers the things. I'm not saying he does it easily, but he does it. He gathers the materials he needs. They go for this journey. They come to this place. They walk up on this hill. He builds an altar. You know, he ties up his son's hand. He lays him on the altar. He gets ready to sacrifice. And, of course, we know God is not going to call us to do that. And he stops him and says, Abraham, you've proven, and your faith has been tested, and you've proven 
And because of that, I'm going to bless you greatly. And he does. And, and, and also, here's a ram that's caught over here in the thicket. That's what you can take and that's what you could use as your sacrifice. And I love what James in James 2.22 says about Abraham's faith. He says this. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what? By what he did. By what he did. His faith and his actions, they were working together. And his faith was made complete, not by just what he thought, not just by his prayers that he prayed. It was made complete by also by what he did. See, what kind of faith honors God? It's a faith that works even when it doesn't make sense. See, we're going to pop back over here to the two blind guys. They've got a problem in their life. And I don't know about you, but when I've got a problem in my life, you know, I, I know what I do. I focus on the problem. I usually blow the, pro blow the problem out of proportion, if I could say it. I usually just blow it up into bigger what it is. I focus on myself, and that's all I think about. And, and I lose sight of any solution, especially any solution that God might bring to it. And here we got these blind guys. They could have been around, oh, well, you know, focus on this problem. Look at it. Woe is us. Woe is me. I've got to walk around with the stick and stuff like that. Because you have to understand, there was no Disabilities Act for them back there. There was no Social Security for them to claim. In their time, in their day, if you were blind like this and had this physical uh, stuff happen to you, especially being blind, it meant... And they taught that that's because you sinned or your parents sinned against God and you were being punished. So if someone saw you blind, you had to carry the shame that you did this wrong. And everybody knows because you're blind, you are a bad person. And so that's what they had to carry on him. So it would have been really easy for them to get selfish and self-centered and focus just on themselves. Woe is me. Look at me. I'm blind. Everybody thinks I've done wrong when I haven't. It was my parents that screwed up. But it doesn't matter. I have to carry the shame, so forth and so on. And they could have done that, you know. But somewhere, somehow, I don't know how, here's one of these blind guys sitting there. And these blind guys is like, well, you know, I can't see, but I can hear. Hearing, okay? And, and I've heard about this guy named Jesus doing some pretty miraculous, powerful stuff. And I heard that he's coming this way. So I can't see, but I can hear. And I've heard that. And I can still speak. So when he comes this way, I can still call out in an animalistic type of cry, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I can't see and I can't hear, but I can speak and I can still get up and walk. And, and though he might not stop for me, I can get up and I can follow wherever he goes and continue to call upon him. You see, there's a lot of things I can't do, but there still are some things that I can do. And in our life, when we look at our life, I know there's probably a lot of things we can't do. But I bet you if we got honest and we stopped, we would realize there still are a lot of things that we can do. In Iowa, I had an elder that got stricken down with cancer. And all he could do was just lay in bed. And Dale was just strong, strapping guy, you know. And, and he was an electrician. And, you know, I mean, big. Stood about 6'4". And all this. And, you know, you wanted something moved, you called him. And, and stuff, you know, and, and he moved it by himself, <laughs> you know, and, and, and he got struck down with cancer and that, and, and, you know, he's laying in bed. He can't move. It's just stripping him. He's just, and he's laying there. What good am I? What good am I? And I'll never forget his wife, you know. I, I'm coming to minister, you know. I'm coming to be there. I'm coming to, you know, as the pastor, I'm supposed to bring in this hope and this joy and this life and, and to minister. And the wife, as I'm listening to Dale pour out his heart to me, grabs his hand and says, Dale, can you pray? Well, you know I can. Then shut up, Dale. <laughs> you got to love wives. Your, your husband's dying. You tell him to shut up, you know. And uh, you know, then shut up, Dale, because you still have a powerful, powerful ministry for God. And start praying. Because there's a lot of things you can't do like you used to, Dale. But there's still something that you can do. And that, that's always been there. You know, when you take a look at your life, you can look and say, okay. So what you're trying to say is, Dave, I just have to have faith and try really hard. And then God has to answer. <laughs> no. Listen to me. I want us to understand. Our faith is not in us. Our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is always in the faithfulness of God. And when our faith is in the faithfulness of God, then we're able to trust him. We're able to trust in what I've heard called the Shadrach, Misho, Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego type of faith. I don't know if you've ever heard of those three teenagers and stuff. I don't know if you've ever read the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, 
But these are some guys that had some massive faith that I love reading in that over and over again. These three Hebrew teenagers, finds them, they find themselves standing before King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar has built this, this, this big statue and everything, and, and this is who everybody's supposed to bow down to. And he finds out that these three Hebrew teenagers, okay, they're worshiping their Hebrew God. And he calls him before and he says, look, this is the God you'll bow to. You'll no longer bow. You'll no longer worship your Hebrew God. If you do, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Again, three teenage boys. Boys, stand up for me. You're going to be a live illustration. Stand up, teenage boys. Okay, come here. Just stand right here. Turn around. Stand next to each other. Okay, <clears throat> three teenage boys. Shadrach, Meshach, yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here you go. All right. Three teenage boys. Right here, this age. This is what you saw standing before King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hi, guys. And so this is what you had. These three teenagers amongst this king that's going to take their life. And these three young men of this age. Thank you, guys. Have a seat. I appreciate that. And stuff. It's just a lot more live with it. Didn't have them first service. You know. But these three guys. Three young teenagers, what do they do? Blows my mind. Because when I was a teenager, I don't know that I would have done this. I would have done what everybody else still does today. The thing that I think is the thing that hurts Christianity and we're struggling with in our faith. But they didn't do that. You know what they did? They, they, they came and they said, no, throw us in the fiery furnace. Go ahead and throw us in the fiery furnace because our God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, guess what? We still believe. See, I wouldn't have done that. If I was their age, when I was their age, I don't know that I would have done that. I would have said, okay, this is what I have to do to get along. And this is what I mean by where I think that we're missing and we struggle in understanding Christianity and our call and our walk and what God wants. God says, look, at this is the lifestyle I have created and called you to live. And then the world shows up and the world says, but you're going to do this. You're going to shut up and never talk about me. Mm, that's not what my God says. My God says that I am called, and if I believe in him, I can't shut up and talk about him. I have to be talking about him. I have to be sharing. I can't. The world says, well, you're going to show up, and you're going to do this. If you don't show up and do this, you don't get a work, or you don't get a play in that sport, or you don't get to do this. That's okay. My God says, this is where I'm supposed to be at that time. So this is what I'm going to do this way, and I'm going to honor my God. And even if my God doesn't show up, guess what? I still believe. I still believe. That's a massive faith, you know? That's a massive faith. And it's the kind of faith I pray for because I struggle with. It's the kind of faith I pray for all of us because I know it's a hard thing. It's the kind of faith that says, that answers the question, do I really believe that God will do this? With every fiber in my body, I want to say, yes, God, you can. Yes, God, I believe you will. And even if you don't, God, I still believe. I still believe. Because you see, my faith is not in my faith. My faith is not in my works. My faith is in the faithfulness of God. A God whose ways are higher than my ways. A God whose thoughts I cannot even wrap and comprehend and wrap my mind around. A God who is good through and through and all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing God. My faith is in that God. In that God. And here's the bottom line as the worship team gets ready to come back up here to continue to allow us to sing to this God that loves us this much that is there for us and willing to be there for us in our life, just like he was all these people that we talked about here today. You say, I have people say to me, well, Dave, that's good for you. You just have your, your blind faith, your simple faith, your blind faith. You just take it absolutely, I will. Because I would rather have and be blind with faith that God can heal than have sight and have no faith at all. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what kind of faith honors God? A faith that believes. A faith that believes even though it doesn't see. A faith that persists even though nothing changes. And a faith that works even when it doesn't make sense. Because that's how good our God is. Do you believe he's able to? I hope you can sit there and say with everything in us, we believe that he can. And even if he doesn't, we still believe. Like I said, we're getting ready to worship here. This God that loves us, that's there for us in so many different ways. And, and the question that, that's been put before us today, you know, do we believe that he can do this? Only you can answer the question for where you are in your walk, your life, your faith, and your journey.
But maybe God brought you here today to hear this question. And, and if your answer is, isn't, yeah, I believe. And even if he doesn't, the way I want it, the time I want it, I still believe, you know. If, if that's where you're struggling to be, I want you to know that we want to be there and walk and do life together with you. We want to walk down that road together with you to help you, you know, understand, you know, and, and to walk on that journey together. That's why you always hear me talk about doing life together. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm not, or maybe I'm not seeing, or maybe I don't have that, because maybe I haven't really surrendered and put God in my life where he needs to be, the head of everything. Maybe when you sit there and think about, wow, can I have and should I have or do I have the, the faith of Abraham? Do I have the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do I have that kind of faith if that was put before me? I don't know. Only you can answer that. And we're going to spend some time in prayer and let the Holy Spirit speak to our heart. And if there's a decision that you want to make, if there is prayer that you need in your life, we want to pull alongside with you, like I said, and be there for you. I'm going to be up front right over here. And, that, and if you want to come forward for prayer, if you want to come forward for whatever reason, come on up. Other, and, and if you still have questions after, see one of us, one of the leaders. There's information in the bulletin and that because we love our God and we want you to know how much God loves you. Let's go before him right now. Father, thanks so much that we could gather, we could celebrate, we could have fun. Lord, we could laugh, we could be reminded, we could rejoice, we could remember at the table. Father God, thank you for it all, and most of all, your presence with us right now and what that means to us, Lord. I thank you for the reality of, of how good you are and how great you are, Father God, and, and, and forgive us at times that maybe we've forgotten that, Lord. But I pray that your Holy Spirit will just look into our lives and search our hearts. Do we believe you're able? Do we believe you're able to give us strength that we need? Do we believe that you're able, Father God, to walk with this and guide, lead, and direct us in our life, Father God? I thank you for the ways that you have, the ways that you are, the ways that you will be, Father. Thank you, Lord. And, and, and as, as your Holy Spirit shows that truth to us, I pray for the wisdom and the strength also to step up and do what we need to do for your will, for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing.